right, all right, all right. Welcome, knowers, to episode 35. How you doing today, penis face? I mean, Patty. I'm an ordinary man, nothing special, nothing grand. Big shout out to Christy Moore. Is that it's it? A phenomenal it. Irish tune. And the reason that I sang that little line is because today, at the end of the podcast, we feature original music at the end of each episode. So anybody that wants to stick around at the end, you're going to hear a, a song from very uh, last week. I think it was uh, was it the band from Kentucky. I don't remember. Okay, so we've had music sent into in us from Australia, from Ireland, from America. And t- at the end of today's episode, we've got a guy called Dylan Welsh. And he's an Irish folk um, singer-songwriter. He was born in Dublin. And he's now based in Nashville, Tennessee. This guy's toured with the Pogues, with the Flog and Mollies, with uh, Billy Bob Thornton. So we're going to play one of his tunes at the end of the podcast. Oh, so Billy Bob Thornton. Billy Bob Thornton, is that... Thornton or Thornton? I have no idea. I thought it was Thornton. I don't know. What the fuck? Who cares? That's why you confused me earlier because you said Billy Bob Thornton. I'm like, <laughs> Thornton? I he, I he was that is. He was, uh, an- <laughs> he was Angelina Jolie's ex-husband, yeah, yeah, wasn't yeah, yeah, he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I told, I told my girlfriend that and she was like, really? Because they, do- they don't look like it, right? Yeah. He used- do you think they used to wear a vial of each other's blood around yeah, their necks? Yeah, that's pretty cool. That's, pretty that's a lot man, cooler than wedding rings. pretty mental. They also had, ta- I think she had a tattoo of him, like Billy or something. Yeah, yeah. Or Billy Bob. Which she had to get covered up. I got Billy Bob tattooed in my forearm. <laughs> and then it's like, uh, hang on a second there. So anyways, yeah. So that's, that's so it. funny. All right. Doesn't get any more hillbilly than that. <laughs> cool, baby. Well, we're jumping back into something we have not done for a very long time, and that is Bioshmack Your Bitch Up. Biohacking, huh? Bioshmack Your Bitch Up. That's my Sean Connery impression. You don't sound like Sean Connery. Not at all. You know, you well, know, who, who, who do I sound like right now? You, sound, sound, like? you sound like... It puts the lotion in the basket. <laughs> <laughs> it puts the lotion on the skin or it gets the hose again. <laughs> you right. sound like fucking Buffalo Bill from, the, <laughs> what's it called? Silence of the Lambs. Yeah, yeah. Sean Connery talks more like this. Mish money, penny. Cool. Our topic is biohacking. And okay. we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, first, I want to talk about my skin rash. <laughs> okay. I think we had a little video on the Instagram, right? Yeah. Uh, let me dive into it a little bit more. I've had a, a raging skin rash, which I thought was herpes for a long time. Um, <laughs> turns out it's not herpes because that's only in your genitals. It's, it's heapies. It's heapies. Herpes um, is, is hers. Her, heapies is yours. So I've had the skin rash for like seven months, and uh, I didn't realize it until recently that it started around the time I started the carnivore diet. Mm-hmm. Uh, like Ninja Ned, uh, basically fruit and meat, and that's it. So... You know, no nuts, which before was a big part of my diet. No rice, which the really anxious, wasn't a big part of my diet The just loved before. him some nuts. Just couldn't uh, get enough of those nuts I all over his face. I can't get enough nuts. <laughs> put as many in my mouth as I can at one time and then try to talk like Mickey Rourke. <laughs> Man, I, I love Mickey Rourke. He's fucking awesome. Me too. Cool. All right, so the skin rash started. And uh, like I said, Saladino, the Saladino carnivore diet. Um, and I go to my buddy's house to finish writing my book and I tell my old, my, my friend who's from South Africa, he's like, Oh, you got scurvy. I'm like, what? He's like, you got scurvy. You're doing a carnivore diet and you're covered in a skin rash. That's scurvy. And I'm like, Oh my God. In high school, that was literally the most derogatory term you could use for an individual. If you called somebody a scurve, boy, thems was fighting words, man. Really? It is fucking awesome. On. A scurve. Yes. You call somebody a scurve, it, it, that's the worst thing you could call somebody in my you high school. dirty scurve. Oh, yeah. It, and now I'm officially like a legit scurve. <laughs> <laughs> I've been a scurve going on eight months, man. When, when, okay. <laughs> when you told me recently that you would quit the carnivore diet because you'd got that skin rash. I seen your skin rash. It was pretty terrible. It's you'd, terrible. All over your fucking neck, your Everywhere. ears, your on head. On my birthday in February, I had it from head to to toe. You look infested like you're infested by some kind of fucking Infesh- disease. You look infested. infested. You look infested. <laughs> hey, say, money penny, you look kind of infested look, look today, infested. but I'll still give it to you anyways because I'm James Bond and that's what I do. But uh, when you said scurvy, the first thing that came to my mind was pirates on pirate ships. Really? Because I learned at school, whether this is the truth or not, that scurvy was brought on by a lack of vitamin C. That's right. From sailors that were out on ships, they wouldn't have uh, access to enough vitamins or minerals or vitamin C and stuff like that and their gums would start to bleed they would get bleeding gums and all that kind of stuff like that 
So yeah. when, when you said scurvy, that's the first thing I thought about. Yeah, some other symptoms are like weakness, no energy, lethargy, sore arms, sore legs, like you said, bleeding gums. Hmm. Uh, and if you don't get it treated, it can decrease the amount of red blood cells you have, gum disease, you just said that, Whoa. change your hair, and you can also even bleed from your skin, which I guess my rash has been so bad I've started bleeding a little bit, not a lot. Hmm. Um, if it gets real bad, your wounds start losing their ability to heal properly. Which could be why I've started injecting liquid cement. You're going to turn into a fucking leper. Yeah. We're going to have to isolate you on one of these little islands here, Leper Island. <laughs> and another <laughs> thing that happens if it, if it goes like untreated for too long is personality changes. I thought that might explain a lot. You have multiple already, so this is just an, <laughs> <laughs> this is just an extra one to add to the fucking list. And, and last but not least, if it goes far too long without being treated, you will die. So scurvy can kill you, yeah? Yes. Uh, in modern times, it, only, it most commonly occurs in people with mental disorders. Check. Check. Unusual eating habits. Check. Check again, yeah. Alcoholism. Pretty much check. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and You're fucked. And older people who live alone. That's mm. true 50% of the time. Not really older, though. No. I would say you're a, you're a yeah. young, you're still a young man. Yeah. So you hit it right on the nail earlier. During the age of sail, it was assumed that 50% of the sailors would die of scurvy on a major trip. And then there was a Scottish surgeon in the Royal Navy, James Lind, and he was credited with proving that scurvy can be successfully treated with citrus fruit in 1753. But it wasn't until 1795 that health reformers such as Gilbert Blaine persuaded the Royal Navy to routinely give lemon juice to its sailors. Uh -huh. Interesting, huh? There you go. So I thought this was pretty cool. And in terms of diet, it's really easy to get caught in a habit and stop assessing your diet or like forget things. Mm. And so I wanted to touch on vitamin C because I was like, man, do I really not get enough vitamin C? I eat a lot of grapefruit. You mean vitamin C, right? Vitamin C. <laughs> vitamin, vitamin, <laughs> vitamin. Va. V vitamin. Vita, va, va. I got to take my vitamins. But it's easy to forget things, you know, like, oh, am I getting enough ma magnesium? Oh, am I getting enough protein? Oh, am I getting enough fat? Am I getting enough vitamin C? Yeah. So what we're going to do today is just go over vitamin C, what we need it for and where we can get it. Okay. Cool. So some animals actually make their own, but we do not. And cooking decreases the residual amount of vitamin C in food. So, so when you cook your food, it, it lessens the amount of vitamin C you right, get. That's right. That's right. So stop cooking your oranges. <laughs> For anybody that, yeah, that cook that fucking boils their oranges or fries up their oranges, stop doing that. Yeah. They're decreasing your amounts of vitamin C. So as we already know, vitamin C supports a healthy immune system. I think that's common knowledge. Uh, it restores antioxidants in your body. Antioxidants prevent cell damage that can lead to diseases. And this is kind of interesting. Vitamin C helps your body metabolize protein and also absorb iron. So mm -hmm. if a girl is on her period, she's losing iron. One thing she should up uptake, up her intake of, mm -hmm. would be vitamin C to help her body absorb more iron. On that note, yes, um, I heard this a few years ago and it made me laugh hysterically. Somebody said, how can you trust something that bleeds for seven days and doesn't die? <laughs> I like it. No comments. <laughs> All right. There's another thing it does. It helps. It actually helps maintain bones, teeth, and cartilage, much like that of calcium. And last, most importantly to me, vitamin C is needed for the biosynthesis of collagen. Oh, yeah. You heard it, baby. Which is a protein that's an essential component of connective tissue. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's what helps wounds heal. So if you're having wounds that aren't healing, um, or if you're ugly as fuck because your skin is sagging. Mm. I'm just kind of kidding. But collagen is really important for, important for joint health. Um, it can also keep you looking younger. Um, and wounds, right? Injuries, stuff like that. That's when you want to start supplementing with collagen. Well, your body can't even get that collagen can't even synthesize it unless you have an appropriate amount of vitamin c in your body that's insane right so vitamin c is important for protein it's also important for collagen okay tell me some of the best sources of vitamin c i know you're going to get onto that anyways but i'm curious right now to know some of the best sources sources of vitamin c cool so the average person uh, a man needs about 90 milligrams a day and a woman needs 75 try to keep that number fresh in your brain because we're going to come back to well it i was a taking a thousand milligrams a day there for a while and i stopped huh. so you said 90 milligrams a day is what a man needs i was yeah. taking a thousand milligrams a day 
And seems like form. a bit. Seems a bit excessive. <laughs> Seeing that you need ninety milligrams, and I'm taking a thousand milligrams. And I actually checked that like oh, three times, shit. and that was like generally what it said. Mm. Uh, what would you say are the be the foods highest in vitamin C? Well, I mean, the one that comes to mind straight away is oranges. Right. We're told it's oranges. That's conventional wisdom, right? Yeah. It's what that's we're told. that's a citrus fruit, right? Right. Like right. You right. said the guys in the ships back in the day, the 1800s, they were given lemon water. Right. Um, I don't. I would just. I would guess. Uh, Certain types of fruits and possibly certain vegetables, but I, I really I really don't know. Cool. All right. Uh, cantaloupe is actually one of the fruits highest in vitamin C. Really? Yeah. If you get a if you like just one slice of cantaloupe has twenty five milligrams. So if you were to eat like four slices of cantaloupe, that would be like all you would really need for the whole day. Oh, man. A medium orange has seventy milligrams. Seventy. Seventy. And a grapefruit only has fifty six. I, I thought a grapefruit had more than orange. Turns out like orange actually has more than grapefruit. The thing is, orange has more vitamin C, but more sugar. Grapefruit has less sugar and a little bit less vitamin C. Yeah. So what do you want? You know, I want my orange because I don't like grapefruit. It's too bitter for me. I love grape. I yeah. love yeah. I love grapefruits, but I think I'm gonna start. I don't know. I'm not actually. Never mind. Forget it. All right. Citrus fruit juices contain even higher amounts of vitamin C with 225 milligrams in a glass of orange juice. But how much sugar is in the glass? Of it? Like if you go, if you go to the store, I'll tell you something. I went to the shop the last day, and I was like, "Man, I'm drinking coconut water all the time. I feel like having a little bit of a change just for today." Mm -hmm. So I seen this this like carton, like a little carton. I don't even. It was less than a liter. It was like 750 mils or something like that, and it was uh, honey lemon water. Oh, I've seen and that, I was dude. Like, it's jacked with sugar. I was like, "Honey lemon water? Sounds oh fuck, good, this right? sounds good. Sounds clean." Jesus. I picked it up and I look at the back, eighty. Eight grams of sugar. Yes. It almost a hundred grams of fucking sugar in this little thing. Are you yeah. kidding me? Yeah. That's the. How, how are they allowed to sell that shit? Like, and that's like I said again before. That's being encouraged by parents to give to their kids. Like you know, a good glass of OJ in the morning start your day. Yeah, there's fifty grams of sugar in that glass of fucking OJ. No yeah. wonder your kids are bouncing off the walls and right. doing somersaults. And let me correct myself. So. In a 225 milligram glass of orange juice, you get 125 milligrams of vitamin C, so which is way more than what you need in one day. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, so another one. Broccoli. Did you know that? Did not. One cup of broccoli has 70 to 80 milligrams. Once again, that's all you need in about, well, for a man, we want to get about 90 milligrams. So that's yeah. almost all you need in one day. Mm -hmm. Another one, it's one of my favorite veggies, purple cabbage. Okay. And purple shit. cabbage is dope because it's purple <laughs> so yeah. it's got like a you know like anything that's purple or red generally has a bunch of flavonoids that are antioxidants and really really good for you uh i use i like stir frying like purple cabbage and almonds and tofu or maybe some okay. chicken in there it's so good that sounds good um half cup of purple cabbage has only has 14 calories so that's the upside and 18 milligrams of vitamin c all right next is kiwi all right do you know in chinese do you know what they call kiwi um, no. Uh, or maybe it's a nickname in Chinese. They call it the Chinese gooseberry. Really? <laughs> yeah. Chinese <laughs> gooseberry. Yeah. The and hell? dude, two kiwis give you 130 to 140 milligrams of vitamin C. That's like not double, but like a one and a half times what you actually need. I had a kiwi yesterday. Yeah. So I've been doing like one to two kiwis every single day because that pretty much gets you for the whole day. Also, kiwis are supposed to be very good for helping you sleep. I think I might have stumbled across that. Supposedly, that's why I was eating them before a few years back. Uh, two kiwis, like maybe an hour before bed, is supposed to help increase. I don't know if it's your deep sleep or... I don't know the, the science again around it, but... Yeah, that's but you why generally don't want to eat too close to sleep, though, right? I think it's an hour uh, before bed or whatever. If you get, that, a, if you get a spike in insulin, then yeah. that might uh, take away some of your so, quality yeah, sleep. Supposedly, so I was, I was trying it out. I got the yellow kiwis. You know those New Zealand ones? Yes. They're yellow. Oh, they're so nice. They're nice and sweet. Sometimes I find the the green ones are a bit sour and a bit bitter, like the kiwis. They're they're a strange fruit, but uh, man, which one? Which one do you think has more vitamin C, the yellow or the green? Well, I'm gonna say the green, just because the way you asked me that question. Wow, wrong. A yellow kiwi has about twice as much as a green. Holy hell! Right? Isn't that insane? Boom. Yeah. Uh, the yellow has about 163 milligrams per hundred grams. And the green has 85 milligrams, almost exactly 50%. Uh, 
uh, so per 100 grams. Maybe that's why those yellow ones are so much more expensive. Yeah, check this out. So kiwis originally grew wild in China until there was a school teacher there, and he liked the kiwis, so he took some of the seeds, and he took them back to New Zealand in 1904. And then the New Zealanders called it kiwi. They named it kiwi after their national bird. Yep. And now they're like, you know, the kiwi uh, tycoons, the kiwi giants. Well, that's that's what you call a, that's what you refer to anybody from New Zealand. You call them a kiwi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People from Australia you call them an Aussie. Well, I guess kiwi is the name of their national bird. Yeah, yeah. I don't think it can fly. It's so check this, bird, uh, check this out. Bell peppers, man. Did you know? I like I've heard this before in passing. Never really like legit digested it, but bell peppers have a pretty good amount of vitamin C. So the yellow has like three. If you get like a good solid yellow bell pepper, has like three, over three hundred milligrams of vitamin C. Mm-hmm. Over three, so this would be an example of a food that when you cook it, the vitamin C goes down. Okay, and I generally like to eat my bell peppers raw anyway. Yeah, but this is funny because these. Ooh, are... baby, I like it raw. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, that song played in the new, uh, the new movie with Jamie Foxx and Snoop Dogg, the zombie movie Daylight. Or I watched Night Shift. I watched most of it, and then I turned it off. It's all right. It's not it's, that yeah, good. Yeah, but they had some good. They had some good music, and they had yeah, a ice, lot of good ice music. Cubes. That, that song's in it. Yeah, Ice Cube's tune was in it as well. Uh, uh, Every time a Wu Tang st- song starts playing, I'm like, "Baby, baby, you see this tattoo on my leg? This is them. This is them." <laughs> I'm just like, "Okay, yeah." She don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> you don't understand. So, a uh, yellow bell pepper has like, like I said, over 300 milligrams, and then a red pepper has a red bell pepper has like 120, I think. Or no, a yellow bell pepper has 341. Insane. And then a red has like 120, and then a green is pretty low. Still got some, but it's pretty low. Huh. So you could just eat a yellow bell pepper or a kiwi in one day and pretty much be set on your vitamin C for the whole day. Huh. So skin rash moves on. So I changed my diet. It improved. And then I had a buddy stop by, and he's like, man, I got a rash. I'm like, what? He'd been doing the carnivore diet too. I'm like, you got a rash? He's like, yeah, I got a rash. Uh, It's a keto rash. I'm like. Keto rash? The fuck's a keto rash? He's like, you never heard of keto rash? I'm like, no. Do I have some sort of hybrid version of <laughs> keto rash and scurvy <laughs> equals yeah. yank for life scurvy yeah. ball? Yeah. Um, and he said he needed to uh up his intake of carbohydrates, up his intake of carbohydrates. And so the keto rash is a rash that mostly occurs in young Asian women. Most of the in-depth research on the subject has previously involved young Japanese women involved in porno. Does he does he identify as a young Asian woman? He does. <laughs> and also, let me remove that porno thing I just said. That's not true. Okay. It does involve young Japanese women, but not in porno. So the keto rash is common amongst young Japanese women? Yeah. Most reports are from Japan. Uh, and up to 2011, only 40 had been reported outside of Japan, which is pretty interesting. Why is this thing keto rash so common in Japan mm. and, and only in young Japanese women? It's very specific. So, um, I dug into this and I found out that when you're doing excessive fasting or you're in ketosis all the time, mm-hmm. do you remember what ketosis is? Yeah, when you you starve your body of food or something like that and your your good cells eat your dead cells. It's when your body starts functioning on fat as opposed to carbohydrates and then your liver okay. starts being overloaded with fats. Your yeah. liver starts to produce ketones, which can make you feel satiated. They can give you energy. They can make you feel good. And okay. it stimulates massive amounts of fat burning. So one of the... So I was way off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's been a while since we talked about it. Yeah. So when you're in ketosis, one of the main ketones your liver will produce is acetone. Do you know what acetone is? The name of a band. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's, that's Acetone is a liquid solvent that can break down and dissolve other substances. It's in nail polish remover, paint remover, and varnish remover, but our body can also produce it. That's crazy, right? Yeah. So uh, when you're first entering ketosis, your body might start producing more acetone than usual. I remember when I first started doing the keto diet, I could taste acetone on my stomach. Uh, oh, my God. I could taste acetone in my mouth sometimes. Oh I would start God. tasting like this sort of like metally, I don't know, like a really strange taste. And I'm hmm. like, huh, oh, because you can actually buy breath strips. Pe- people who are really in the keto diet, they'll buy breath strips and then they'll breathe onto the breast strip and that will tell them their ketone levels. 
because people are really into the keto diet. They like test their blood or they test their urine or they test their breath because they want to know, am I in ketosis and what foods will pull me out of ketosis? Whoa. So if your body's producing massive amounts of acetone, guess what? The acetone will start coming out in your sweat and this can irritate your skin and cause a skin rash. Huh. Right. And so the keto rash often impro- uh, often occurs in places like, what am I showing you? The place where you would get blood taken from that I like, hate. What do you call this? Like armpit? Your elbow? Like your, no, it's, okay, so. Fo- like where I would shoot up heroin? That that area, people know. Your f- above your <laughs> forearm, yeah. What do you call that? Behind your elbow? In front of your elbow? And behind your knees? Yes. Yeah, like like those spots. Your pits. I <laughs> Those two places you just mentioned, I have a huge problem with being touched there. I, I, I can't get blood taken from that part of my body. I'll yeah. pass out cold. I like so going I have to, the, to get taken from my hand. I like going to the hospital if I have a long sleeve shirt on. And they want to take bloods. I always show them my arm that's totally covered in tattoos mm-hmm. just to see the reaction. Mm-hmm. And they're always like, "Uh, can we use your other arm?" Because <laughs> <laughs> I got a, I have a tattoo right at that spot. Because back in the day <sighs> when I used to, there. back in the day when I used to shoot up, yeah. you get track marks and bruises. Yeah. And so I decided, oh, I'll just get a tattoo there. Yeah. That way I can shoot up as much as I want. And nobody will ever know. Holy hell, man. <laughs> oh, but I, I have I have tattoos on both of my inner forearms, and they both stop a good distance before that part of your arm you're talking about. I have a big problem with, with being touched there or anything. I don't know what that is about, but um, yeah. Yeah, so people – so um, so what I've done is I'm trying to now keep myself out of ketosis. Right. And also Hmm. like fasting, if I do a a 48 hour fast, I mean, the reason you're doing the fast is to try to put yourself into ketosis Mm -hmm. and start burning fat and stop running on carbohydrates. Mm. Normal people uh, with normal diets, they use carbohydrates for energy, right? I need the rice for energy. I need the bread for energy. I need the potatoes Mm. for energy. People on the keto diet, they rely on coconut oil. They rely on nuts. They rely on fats for energy. Mm. And then they also rely on their body to burn fat for energy. Mm. Um, but apparently this is not good for me, but still, to be honest, I'm not sure if I have scurvy or if I have (laughs) keto rash. All I know is now, do you feel like a, do you feel like a Japanese woman? Sometimes. Then maybe it's, it's... sometimes I feel, uh, (laughs) sometimes I feel, (laughs) sometimes you feel (laughs) like a Japanese, uh, (laughs) a woman. Do that way better. (laughs) Nihongo o choto hanesemasu. I studied Japanese for two years. Then you absolutely have have a keto rash then. <laughs> Somewhere deep down inside you, Yank, there's a, there's a little Japanese woman waiting to get out and break the surface. You know, I think in high school I did kind of... Wait a second. I didn't <laughs> identify as a woman. I identified with women. Okay. Like all my friends were girls. Yeah. It was great. I loved it. Oh, it was fuck. like uh, heaven in a way. You know, because in high school, that's what every man wants yeah. is to be wanted by women. Hmm. But what I was doing was like friend zoning them. Okay. And then I slid it in when they least expected it. <laughs> 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 what? No, I'm, that's joke. Kind of. But you like, too. But like I would like run around with crews of girls. Like I'd have yeah. a crew of like three girls and yeah. I'd hang out with them for like a year mm-hmm. and then you know i'd become a sophomore and then yeah. i found like another crew of girls and i'd run around with them for like a year huh. i just i think I, because i was raised mostly by my mom and her sisters mm. i felt comfortable with femininity mm-hmm. femininity mm-hmm. and liked being around girls and i spent a lot of time around women growing up huh yeah i grew up with three sisters that's right so we and both grew and up a around mother. a lot of feminine energy me mother me mother me three sisters How and d- me brother how did you become so manly? <laughs> I had no fucking choice. I grew up in the rough, tough, mean streets of, yeah. of County Mayo. The, uh, the the term toxic masculinity is, is definitely rife there where I grew up anyways. Yeah. It's un- unreal. Yeah. Sometimes I wonder if we have it. People are becoming more aware of all that kind of stuff now. Like, you What know? is toxic mas- masculinity? It's where, I guess, a man looks at himself like he has to be a certain way or he has to act a certain way like he has to be tough he has to be emotionless he can't express his feelings he can't talk about things that are bothering him like you know mental health things all this is being brought to the forefront now by lots of like uh like athletes and famous people like that you know that would have suffered things like this tyson fury is probably a good example you know he had a lot of mental health problems and uh, he started speaking out about it. Now you've got everybody. Paddy Pimblett from the UFC is talking about it. Because men didn't feel like they could talk about their 
emotional problems before. Do you know what I mean? It's like, that's a woman thing. You know what I mean? I'm a man. I, I swallow my, you know, my emotions and all this kind of stuff. Pull myself up by my bootstraps. Th- that's it. Yeah, you know, and I'm tough. I put on this front and I, I don't show my emotions. And that's, I mean, we're human. What did you say right before the podcast? Something leather? Hell, Hell for leather. Hell for leather. Okay. Is that, <laughs> yeah. that related here? So that's, that's, I think that's what tos- toxic masculinity is. It's just this portrayal of the man has to be that. You know what I mean? Brooding and, and big and muscular and, you know, whatever like that. So that's not it. being comfortable, being vulnerable and being open about your emotions. Yes. Just, you know, yeah, exactly. How, how you are and, and stuff like that. Like here in Taiwan, like I have a lot of boxing students. And some of my earlier students, they would tell me, I'd be like, okay, why, why do you want to start boxing? What's your interest in boxing? Because when I look at them, they don't look like a guy that would, you know, slim little guy wearing glasses, short. And it's like, oh, my girlfriend uh, says I'm not manly enough really had multiple, guys have said that to i've you? had multiple students tell me that or just that they don't feel manly enough and i'm like well okay that's i was shocked the first time i heard it and i was like all right well you come to the right place sonny jim uh, they get down there and give me 20 fucking push-ups before i give you a slap across the back of the ear boy what's what's the opposite of toxic masculinity F- fe- being feminine demasculated right well demasculated i don't know the, so you've got that just i think it's like um putting on that front that front and then there's the pack mentality too that goes with that like when there's groups of guys hanging out you know what I mean right a pack mentality forms very quick like do you know what I mean there'll be a dominant one in the pack like he's the guy that's uh, you know like group group think right? yeah exactly yeah but that comes down to then you know everybody trying to be tough or trying to prove themselves or stuff like that which again I think it is ridiculous now at this point you know everybody should be able to if you can be comfortable in your own skin, it's a good thing. You yeah, I mean? think me, you, and and Ned were like athletic and strong, but we none of mm. us ever do that. No, it's not. It's not at all. It's like. But when I was growing up, like the football players were like that. Man, the town I came from, that's it. Like Gaelic football, GA. It was like they, they were like what you call frat boys in America. Right, right. You know what I mean? And they were like that. That was the frat boys, and you know they all hung out together. They all drank in the same places, and you know they would just get drunk and get in fights. But they played for the team. They played for the local team. So no matter what any of them done they were never looked down upon by the community. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Whereas like someone like myself, I was into music, I was in a band, you know, we'd smoke a bit of weed and do whatever like that. Anything we'd done, it was always like, everyone in the town was like, oh, these guys are scumbags. They're this and that. They don't even play football. It's like, so like what? If I play football, somehow I'm, you know what I mean? I'm a better person. Like what yeah. the fuck? You're kicking a ball around the field. Kicking a ball. And the, like the man beside you will die for you in the game of football. Like what the fuck are you guys talking about? You're mental. So that was a big problem where I grew up, I think anyways. Art and music are generally associated as being more feminine, <laughs> right? As to mm. where sports are uh, commonly seen as being more masculine. And yeah. So you went down the music path, right? It's just, it was always in me. I mean, later on in life, I went on to, to box, like, yeah. competitively. But it's like, again, does that change anything about me? Like, it's like, no, nothing. Like, I'm still, I'm still into music and art and all those things. But I happen to get in a ring and fight people. And I have that dog in me. So it's like... These people that are doing that, a lot of the times they're not comfortable by themselves. They can't be, they're not comfortable. They're not comfortable enough to stand out by themselves. And I'm going to read you a quick quote now um, by Bruce Lee. And I love this quote. It's one of my favorite Bruce Lee quotes of all times. And <laughs> of all times. <laughs> what did you and, say? <laughs> of all times. Of all time. <laughs> <laughs> it's my favorite of all times. And uh, it's very relevant. It's my because... favorite quote of all time. Oh, man, I was trying to do Mike Tyson. You see how bad I am at impressions? <laughs> I'm the most ruthless, most ruthless champion that's ever been. No one can match my style. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this uh, this Bruce Lee quote, I think, is, is applicable to that group mentality. And uh, like I said, again, the, the GAA players at home, most of the time these guys, they have to stick in a the group. They have to stay together. They follow the leader of the pack. Whereas I was always just like the guy that wanted to do my own fucking thing. I didn't give a fuck about anybody else. And this Bruce Lee quote says, We tend to have more faith in what we imitate than in what we originate. We often feel that we cannot derive a sense of absolute certitude from anything which has its roots in us. The most poignant sense of insecurity comes from standing alone. We are not alone when we imitate. So that that's to do with... There's a lot of fear in standing alone and being different, right? There you go. Yeah. It doesn't take anything. It doesn't take, okay, for somebody to go... Let's say in that group, they get... What's the word? They get... um approval from everybody else in the group and they're comfortable yes i'm comfortable getting this approval of doing what everyone else is doing and and uh, playing along and being part of the team whereas to stand alone by yourself and say well this is actually what i do and it's different to what everybody else does it's like whoa you know what i mean people have a fear of doing that and then a lot of the great people like let's say bruce lee and a lot of these great people they are 
they epitomise this quote. They are the ones that stand alone. And mm. it takes a lot of balls to do that. So I watched um, a TED Talk with Ethan Hawke yesterday about creativity. And in this TED Talk, he talks about how when he was young, he was really into poetry. And his favorite poet was Allen, Allen Ginsberg. And Allen Ginsberg read this poem like on a talk show or something. Mm. And then everybody like made fun of him and was laughing at him and joking at him. Yep. And somebody said, aren't, aren't you embarrassed? You know, the whole world's laughing at you. He's like, that's my job. My job is yeah. to be laughed at. And society is not really a good judge of characters or anything. And Ethan Hawke was kind of saying, like, be the oddball. Let the mm -hmm. world laugh at you. But be mm -hmm. true to yourself. Yep. Be honest. Be the oddball. Let people laugh at you. Encourage it yeah. because you're doing something. And most people are afraid to do things yeah. because they're afraid to be laughed at. Being judged. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The people that create the world we live in right now or created the world we live in right now with a smartphone, with with anything, with any of the technologies you run, they were the, the oddballs probably or the lone people. Oh, that, yeah. That like Steve, had... Steve Jobs and, and Mark Wahlberg. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Wahlberg. That was an accident. I don't know why, but I'd, I'd, I don't know why, but I'd love to box Mark Wahlberg. I'd love to get wow. in the ring and fight Mark Wahlberg. He's oh. heavy. He's heavier than me, but I reckon I'd whoop his ass. That's a good question. If you could fight anybody, who would you fight? But I don't know. I'd I don't know why. I don't. I don't dislike <laughs> him too much, but I just would love to box. They Mark did that Wahlberg. in Fight Club. You remember in Fight Club? He was like, if you could fight anybody, yeah. who would you fight, dead or alive? Yeah. I can't remember what Edward Norton said. <laughs> uh, I think he might have said Gandhi. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Gandhi would. I would say. I would say Trump. Gandhi you could put me in a ring fight. with Trump. Yeah. That would be my favorite. I'd say Trump would fight dirty. Oh, yeah. He would fight dirty. He'd have some fucking... I'd go in there with a the switchblade, man. He wouldn't be coming he, out of the he, ring. <laughs> he'd, have some, he'd have some fucking... Some concrete in his gloves. He'd be fucking... He'd, he'd do the thing somebody done against Ali. they put something on, on the gloves, and when the guy hit Ali in the, eye, in the face, the, all the liquid went into Ali's eyes, and Ali couldn't, couldn't see. No shit. Ali fought this round. I don't remember who he fought against. He fought pretty much blind for the whole round. Wow. And still whooped the guy. Like, yeah. uh, like, like one of our faves. Uh, shit, what's his name? The British dude with one eye. Uh, Michael Bisping. Michael Bisping. He's a yeah. hero. he's a hero, man. man. He's a hero to be able to do what he did with such little, with so little. He did so much with so little, which he, just goes to show that anybody can do anything they put their mind yeah. to. He basically fought with one eye. With one eye, and then he also <laughs> like his knee was all messed up, yeah. and like he had all kinds of problems. But he's like, I'm, it's I'm going. Let's go. Crazy. I yeah. don't care. No, and then I think he even his one eye was blind, and then blood went into his other eye. And I think he was like almost totally blind and kept fighting. Man, that that's a lot of heart there. That is a lot, a lot. That's called grit. That's that's yeah. Goggins grit. That's grit and determination. That's Goggins grit. So what were we, what were yeah. we on? What were we talking about there before we got into uh, this? Just being an oddball and standing oh, yeah. out. I think I might. Yeah, we were talking about high school, being a scurve. <laughs> and I'm, then I'm not a perma scurve. You've got guys like Kurt Cobain and a lot of these musicians. Oh, that's they, right. They I was weren't. Say, they didn't conform. They weren't part of this frat boy thing and all that you know they were they stood out by themselves as individuals and that's i think that's where creativity flourishes creativity flourishes not in in a group for the most part i mean they have uh, let's do group art classes and let's do group uh creative thinking and it's like yeah a lot of these people done it by themselves or then they came with a small group of people like the chili peppers a small yeah. little group that comes yeah. together and then creates something amazing magic happens you know toxic masculinity is an issue but uh demasculation is also a really big issue you know, do you think yeah. Kurt Cobain was demasculated? Um, I Kurt Cobain was was uh, very conscious about his weight and being too skinny. Really, he, he even tried to drink protein shakes at one stage really? and, and lift weights. Yeah, really. I read a lot of books on Kurt Cobain because yeah. he wore dresses. He was really stringy, and you know, he was not athletic. And I wonder if like he was demasculated. Um, I mean, I don't know. Like, I know he, he was from what I've read about him. He was conscious about that. He was I was conscious about it, demasculated but. until I met you, <laughs> and I think my whole life I just acted tough. But I most knew, people do. I knew I had nothing to back it up. In the heat of the moment, if shit went down, yeah. there was actually nothing I could do. Most people do act tough and put on a front. Yeah. Most people, yeah, that you that you encounter do. But you are tough. You, you're definitely tough now, anyways. You know, <laughs> Thank you. You've, you've, been, you've been tested and tr tried and tested. Yeah. Uh, but most people do because most people are afraid. Most people are afraid, especially of confrontation. Nobody really wants to. You know, even if you're trained out of fight and stuff like that, you still have fear of confrontation. Like you don't want to get in a confrontation with somebody or a violent confrontation, especially even if you're trained how to fight, because you never know how it will go. And it's like true, true. It's very, it's very um, 
animalistic. It's very chimp-like. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. We're, we are chimps at the end of the day. We're just a, we're just a smarter like chimp. Like dueling. I was, I, I, when we did the episode of dueling, I kept being like, man, how are they so immature? How are yeah. they so immature to think a duel will solve their problem? But really, a, a UFC and, fight's not much different, and is like, it? Like the, <laughs> yeah, well, well, it's a lot different. It's for sport, money. It's that's sport. sport. Yeah, it's yeah. sport. I can see, I can see that that's completely different. Like those two ladies that uh, had that duel they shot each other with pistols and mm-hmm. missed and then they picked up swords and fought and that was over one of them said the other uh, one looked older than she was yeah 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 and they had a fucking bloody battle over that like yeah we're so sensitive humans are so sensitive we are really you know I'm glad we're past shit like that well I mean I'm still I, fuck I don't think I'm past I'm, I'm aware of it well I guess I essentially did a lot of dueling when I followed the Grateful Dead when mm. I had my arch nemesis and yeah. every time we saw each other boom like all out fucking warfare maybe it was me against mm. him or maybe it was me and my crew against him and his crew, That's but crazy, it was just man. every time for like a year straight. And the whole time, I had no clue how to fight. And every time I lost a fight, I got more demasculated and more demasculated. And then I needed to put up a stronger front, a stronger front, and act more harder and get more tattoos and a longer chain. You know, I would have just joined uh, a boxing club or a kickboxing club. I or should have. Work. That's I what have. I would have done. I, you know, my parents put me in Taekwondo, but... Gosh, if I have a kid, mm. man, that kid is going to be boxing before 10 years old. Oh, yeah. You know, like yeah. yoga, boxing. Yeah. Because I've learned so much from boxing with you, as yeah. I've said many, many, many times. But, yeah. like, desensitized me to violence, taught me how to not be reactive when getting hit. Yep. Taught me how to be patient, look and for the right hits. controlled and relaxed. And also, I think it's really good for me as a man. Yeah. Um, for confidence, for testosterone. 100%. Um, for security. Yeah. And if I were to have a family, yeah. I would know that at least I have a clue of what to do if a psychopath, you know, tries to do something crazy. Yeah, you always, like like you said there again, the confidence that it gives you as well, like learning a sport like boxing or kickboxing or anything like this or jiu-jitsu is like, it, it does give you that bit more confidence and also that time to think or analyze the situation if a situation occurred. I've never got in a street fight since I learned how to box. Never. And before I learned how to box, I got in tons of street fights. <laughs> and I had no idea how to Same fight. here, I guess. I, I had no idea how to fight, really. Yeah. And then since I started boxing, I was like, holy hell, man. Yeah. Like, whoa. Like, if I ever happened to have came up against somebody that was trained, you'd just get your ass whooped, like, no doubt. Yeah. So, having that knowledge now, and it's just... I think it makes you more calm and more level-headed, like, than somebody that would get into a, an argument with that and they just go to 100 and then they can't control themselves, you know, and they, they want to brawl and stuff like that. And it's like, most of the time, people that are trained to fight don't get in these situations. Right. Most of the time, it's not people that, that are actually trained that are in these situations because yeah. they know what they can do. And they know that, hey, this guy doesn't know what this, he's, how to fight. This makes me think back to when I was in elementary school, I was playing baseball. <laughs> yeah. And I kept getting hit in the face. And mm. that was how I learned I needed glasses. <laughs> <laughs> and then, <laughs> yeah. And then in middle school... I started playing football, and every time everybody would just plow me. Yeah, and so I always sat on the bench. Yeah, and now that I look back, that demasculated me at that time. You huh. know, Sweet. and then I tried out for the basketball team, and I didn't make the cut. And so here I am, a boy, mm. and in my head, I'm yeah. internalizing this as, well, I'm not good at baseball, I'm not good at football, mm. I'm not good at basketball, so I'm not good at being a man. That's a very good, interesting point there that you made. You know. That's a very interesting point that you made. And I wonder how many people experience that, internalize that, and then live with it. A lot. A hell of a lot of people. Like I yeah. said, if you grew up in a small community town like I grew up in, less than a thousand people, around a thousand people, and like the pride of the town is the football team, the game right, football right. team. And everyone that plays in that, they're like, you know, the pillars of the community. Mm-hmm. And if you don't, like I said, you don't play that, you're not into that, or you're not a part of that, you're an outsider, automatically an outsider, or like looked down upon, or like you said, you feel less masculine or something like that. Or in my brother's case, he took up boxing at like 10 and then it was like, you know what I mean? Yeah. It, didn't, it didn't matter then. He was whooping ass everywhere he went. But wow. uh, if you didn't do something like that, that's that's exactly true. A lot of people would think, oh, I'm not I'm not manly enough or I'm not whatever. Whereas, again, this should be taught in the schools. Well, this is the thing about like when you think about aboriginal tribes or tribes in the Amazon. What do they have that we do not? A rite of passage, mm-hmm. you know, that symbolizes you are becoming a man or you are becoming a woman. Yep. You know, they have rites of passage. And that's not something we have in modern society. We have it in Ireland. You know what it is? What? I'm 18. I'm allowed to drink alcohol now legally uh, and I can buy alcohol legally. Uh, legally. That's what it is. That's the right. Ro- oh, you've become a man now. Now you're a grown up. You're 18. You can fucking buy I alcohol. I guess. May- well, we have to be 21 <laughs> in the US, but that's that good. might. I don't know. Maybe it's the same thing, but it's not. It's not good. It's not legit. I of guess for not. Mexican cultures, they have a quinceanera for the girls. 
What's that? Uh, quinceanera. I think it's for their 16th birthday or the 13th. <laughs> it just symbolizes their coming to be a woman. Mm-hmm. So that's pretty. That's actually like a rite of passage that's still present in modern day society. Okay. But I think that's something that like, I don't know. I guess like maybe like Joe Rogan, if he were to take his son on a hunting trip, mm-hmm. that would be a great example of a modern day rite of passage. Okay. You know, but I think it is something missing and it is something we need because this demasculation is, is a prevalent problem in modern society just as much as toxic masculinity right right they're both issues yeah i feel like people again like i said are becoming more aware of these things uh back in the day when i was growing up like these terms i've never heard these terms or never had the insight or the thought about these kind of things where i said people should be educated on this in school there should be classes where they get taught about these things you know what i mean we've suggested many things that should be classes in school you know what school doesn't do school doesn't prepare you for the real world Right. There's school no class on finances. No. There's no class on fi- uh, emotional intelligence. No. School does not fucking prepare you for the real world. Whereas yeah. it should. High school, that's where you're, you're, you're kind of, your mo- your mind gets molded. It dumbs you down a little bit, doesn't it? I don't know. Mm. I, I feel like history class may dumb you down a little. I loved history class, but but that, I was, I'm fascinated well, with history. I say history. that because it's a lot of lies. Yeah. Like the, what, what I was taught about Christopher Columbus. Well, there you, you go. You know what I mean? Like it's it's really, in a way, it's, it's sort of like George Orwell's like, manipulation manipulation of the past mm-hmm. you know to control the present yep. and that's kind of what i feel our history classes yep. were in the u.s i don't know maybe i'm overstating it <laughs> dope well let's go ahead and tie this one up that we rocked out with their socks out yeah cool um anybody out there that's listening i mean i don't know if we, i don't know if we have many young listeners i really don't know uh what the age group is of li- people that listen well, maybe but- we have some parents listening yeah, well, there you go. Yeah. So if we have parents listening, you know, if, again, if you're feeling anyways like the Yank said there, you're feeling demasculated, you said? Demasculated, like you don't feel like a man. You yeah. feel like you're not man enough or something. And I'm not saying that you need to feel that way, but it's important to be aligned with your identity. And obviously today, today's generation is way more confused and has a lot more on their plate than we ever did because now everybody's like, am I gay? Am I lesbian? Yep. Am I bisexual? Do, should I should I change my sex? Am I queer? You know, and unfortunately, I think that makes this newer generation, it makes their time in high school and their time through puberty even harder because they have more questions to answer than we did when we were younger. Oh, there were simpler times, Yank. There were simpler oh, times. There were simpler there times were simple, back then. There were simple times when we were young. <laughs> All right, anyways, let's wrap it up with that. Uh, thanks for listening again, everybody. Please subscribe to the podcast on Spotify or Apple, wherever you listen. Uh, engage, like, um, comment if you like what we're talking about. Um, hit us up on Paddy at the Yank, uh, podcast at gmail.com. Don't send me your comments on Facebook Messenger. Post them on YouTube. <laughs> we, also have, uh, we also have the YouTube channel. Check that out. We're going to have some videos coming soon. So today we're going to leave you with a tune called At the Sea. At Sea. At Sea, yeah, by Dylan Welsh. And Dylan um, is originally from southeast Dublin. But now he's he's located or based out of Nashville, Tennessee. Like I said, this guy's toured with a lot of people. He's toured with Flog and Molly's. No, no effects, right? Um, the Pogues. Pogues, one of my favorite bands of all time. Uh, Billy Bob yeah, Thornton, and, Thornton. Thornton. Yeah, and he's a folk, Irish traditional, blues yeah, musician. So this is At Sea by Dylan Welsh. Enjoy it, everybody. Take care. not the be in that sea, it's the shore you want to watch out for True every frontier, crusaders pull What if we drift too far and what if we're too late That's gonna depend on what you're hoping to see And the sea arises, and the sun it sets There are no compromises Let us not forget Have you figured out what we're out here for? Cause we're not helping anymore
Walk in you free when nobody believes in that shit anymore I guess I got it in my gut that We could still do more You know what the wars are for You know the money they make Let's give them something to think about Before we let them take And the sea arises And the sun it sets There are no compromises Let us not forget There's no use in saying that's the way it is And the way it'll always be Have you figured out what we're out here for Cause we're not helping anymore